The Vampire's Price A Short Scary Story Written by Stories from the Attic Narrated by Robin McConnell As curator of the Onger Slate Curiosity Museum, I have seen my fair share of strange and often disturbing artefacts. From witch bottles filled with nails and urine, recovered from the walls of medieval buildings, to supposedly haunted dolls, a puppet made from a shrunken scoundrel and the bones of Roman soldiers. This collection has seen it all. A vast cornucopia of ephemera and arcana, all linked by their ability to arouse wonder or catch the interest of those who are particularly drawn to the strange and the macabre, its scope is beyond even what you can imagine. You name it, if it is of a strange, fortean, or mildly grisly nature, then in all likelihood, at one time or another, it will have passed through my hands, or spent time amongst our collection. Of all the strange exhibits housed amongst these shelves, however, there is only one that has ever truly chilled my blood. Only one whose image follows me home, occupying a corner of my mind long after the museum has closed, and I am lying in bed at home, awake and alone in the dark, listening. I must explain that the sense of unease I feel around this artifact is not simply superstition, nor is it due to the thing's appearance. In fact, unlike many of the other more gruesome exhibits we have on display, this item is a somewhat innocuous, if not beautiful, piece. The reason why I avoid touching or even being close to this particular piece is not because of some ephemeral notion or haunting tale, but because I know its story better than anyone else alive, at least in the conventional sense. I know it to be genuine because at one point this item's long and storied history intersected directly with my own in the most literal sense. I can speak personally to its authenticity and, terrifyingly, to the truth behind its outlandish legend. A legend which, unlike the others, has not faded with time, but has become stronger, and, I fear, is still alive and well, even as I write these words. The item in question is labelled in our collection as The Tooth of Judas, Whilst the name of the item may lead the reader to suppose that this piece would be better housed in some reliquary or in the vault of some religious institution, its moniker is somewhat misleading. The tooth is not, as one might think, an actual molar said to have belonged to Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Christ, nor is it actually a real tooth of enamel and dentine at all. Rather, it is a hunk of solid silver, fashioned to resemble a canine tooth, which nevertheless can and indeed has been worn in place of a missing tooth. The link to the biblical character, as some readers may have guessed, lies in the fact that the silver used to fashion the tooth is alleged to have been taken from the thirty pieces given to Judas as payment for his betrayal of Jesus. For those not familiar with the story, the Gospel of Matthew states that Judas Iscariot, one of Christ's twelve apostles, and therefore one of his closest friends and confidants, betrayed him by selling him out to the authorities who planned to eliminate him. Placing a kiss upon his cheek, an act which then allowed the authorities to identify, arrest, and eventually execute Jesus, the betrayer became an archetype, shorthand for avarice, duplicity, and wickedness. According to Matthew's account, Judas received thirty pieces of silver as payment for turning in his friend and teacher, coins which, depending on which account you believe, he either gave back in a fit of remorse or used to buy the potter's field, a field in which, in an agony of guilt, he eventually hanged himself, his bowels spilling out as he did so. A suitably gruesome end for history's most notorious traitor. For many centuries, the authentic silver pieces, or Judas pennies as they are known, were believed to have been held in a vault in the Vatican in Rome, having been brought together into a single collection in the late 13th and early 14th century. 
the reason for this being that a papal edict written in 1291, a copy of which can be read in the online editions of Vatican Public Records for those interested in such things, tasked the famed Monsignor John Lamentor with collecting the pieces. Lamentor, who was thirty years old when he received this order, was charged with retrieving any and all extant examples of such relics, no matter where they might be housed. This Herculean task, which required years of research even before he set out to investigate the numerous churches and cathedrals that claimed to have authentic pieces, took Lamentor twenty years to complete, and indeed became his life's work. In his search for these disparate fragments, Lamentor is said to have visited 170 separate churches in over 27 individual countries throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. A feat which, measured by the standards of the time, would have made him one of the most widely travelled men on earth. Though collecting 30 pieces from 150 separate locations might initially seem to make no mathematical sense, it is worth noting that Lamentor had no way of knowing which churches housed genuine relics and which, knowingly or not, displayed fakes or imitations. It is also worth considering that Lamentor did not return with only 30 or even 150 pieces, as of course many of the parishes in question claim to have more than one coin from the supposed 30 involved in the act. As a result, by the time he finally returned to Rome in 1311, Lamentor had collected well in excess of 600 silver coins, all claiming to have been given to Judas, and amongst which it was thought the thirty genuine pieces would be found. Whilst Lamentor's journey was in itself a miraculous effort, the job was far from complete. Assessing which of the pieces collected could actually have passed through the hands of the betrayer would be no easy task, and according to the records, deciding which of the pieces were genuine took the better part of a decade and involved over one hundred members of the clergy. It is at this point that the history of these artefacts becomes somewhat hazy. Exactly where they were housed after this point remains a mystery that theologians, archaeologists, and historians have argued about ever since. Even now, there are places such as the Hunt Museum in Limerick that claim to have examples of the genuine article. They don't. I say this not to undermine or disparage the efforts made by the experts at the hunt. I am sure that they and even some of the visitors to that institution believe the coin to be genuine. It is from the correct period and geographical location, and though the too perfect inscription of the price of blood etched onto the reverse makes it a little dubious for my tastes, in the eyes of most it has as good a claim as any. It is only because I have been cursed to know otherwise that I can say, with all certainty, that the coin isn't genuine. How I can be so certain is the subject of this story. For much of my working life I both owned and operated a specialist antiques dealership in London, my specific interest and speciality being the sale and acquisition of rare religious artefacts, Whilst the actual transactions that made me money involved sitting behind a desk or manning the counter at our premises in London, and it was here that clients viewed the pieces and money changed hands, I was, in actual fact, rarely there. So rare and highly prized were my acquisitions that, if I sold four in the space of a year, it was more than enough to afford me a comfortable lifestyle and to finance the travels that I undertook. In reality, Rather than manning the counter in some dusty antiques dealership, the actual bread and butter of my profession and the pursuit which took up the majority of my time was the tracking down and acquiring of the items in the first place. This process, which often involved prolonged and sometimes dangerous trips to remote locations, was as exciting as it was morally dubious. It was also tremendous fun. I will admit that even before the day that Mr. Truman Barrymore first darkened my door, I had more than once imagined myself as a modern John Lamentor, 
scouring forgotten churches and hidden mosques in far-flung corners of the map in search of books, icons, ornaments, and effigies, all of which believers and collectors would pay astronomical prices to possess, either because they were obsessive in their pursuit or because they believed these objects to be endowed with powers and properties far more valuable than money. I am partly proud and partly ashamed to say that I never left a client disappointed, no matter the lengths to which I had to go in order to secure a piece. However, whilst I will admit that my transactions often involved nefarious, underhanded, or indeed outright deceitful measures, I would not describe anything I ever did as truly evil. In fact, Evil was something I considered to be many steps removed from my own humble pursuits, and indeed my life, until the day I met Truman Barrymore. Then, all at once, it seemed that evil had followed me home. Even now, decades later, I am still waiting for it to leave. I first met Truman Barrymore in the summer of 1983. I had been sitting at a table in a small café in Istanbul, sipping periodically from a tulip-shaped glass of Turkish tea, and examining, as I did, a partially fractured statuette of St. Peter, wondering whether I should admit to the breakage which would reduce the thing's value, or pass it on to one of the skilled craftsmen with whom I worked, in the hope that they might be able to repair it in such a way that the damage would not be obvious. I was in the process of weighing up the moral and financial implications of this decision when, all at once, I noticed that the sun on my table had been obscured by some obstacle, and a long shadow had fallen over its surface. Looking up, I saw that the cause of this sudden darkening was a tall man who was standing almost touching the edge of the table and looking down at me. He was dressed from head to toe in black, in a manner that I assumed must have been stiflingly hot in the oppressive heat of the city. Noticing that the man was not, as I first suspected, simply passing by, I immediately reached forward protectively and scooped up the statuette, wrapping it hastily in a thick cloth and placing it back into my satchel. Still, the man had neither moved nor spoken. Rather, he simply stood there, looming over the table like some great obelisk or monolith, that had been suddenly erected as an ornament. Slightly perturbed and not a little put out by this, I looked directly into the man's face and addressed him sternly. I'm sorry, was there something I could help you with? I said, in that typically English way of using an empty offer of assistance when what one actually wants to communicate is unvarnished dissatisfaction with the person's continued and intrusive presence on the planet. It was a stupid thing to say, because it allowed Barrymore... American and therefore oblivious to the subtleties of polite rudeness, the opportunity to actually take me up on the offer. Putting himself down in a seat at my table, he seemed to assume that the question had been an invitation. There are a number of things you can do for me. That's why I'm here, he hissed with a strangely crooked smile. I sighed, realizing, as I did, that I was now doomed to at least make polite conversation with this individual who had apparently, deliberately sought me out. Barrymore, meanwhile, as nonchalant and relaxed as if he were seated with an old friend, rather than someone upon whom he had just imposed himself without explanation, took out a foul-smelling cigarette and began to smoke it, flicking the ash without a care into the small bowl in which several sugar cubes were still stacked. I think it is safe to say that I disliked Barrymore from the start, though his money and the delicious habit it had of becoming my money increased the threshold of my tolerance a great deal. I must also admit that despite being a repulsive and ill-mannered individual and a nightmare to share any close proximity with, he was nonetheless a committed and gifted scholar and a fiercely intelligent man. Not to mention the fact that most prominent amongst his dirty habits was his continued insistence upon being filthy rich, a quality which I always find enamoring amongst my acquaintances, especially when they are in the habit of sharing. Over the course of several hours on that first day, 
Barrymore explained that he was not only a biblical scholar and an avid collector of religious artifacts, but also, he insisted, a sorcerer. Despite my best efforts, this last claim still raised an eyebrow, which my new friend clearly translated as being indicative of disbelief. He smiled at this and, clicking his fingers, imploded the glass from which I had been drinking without touching it. Recoiling from the shattered glass and patch of tea that now seeped into the tablecloth, I eyed him cautiously. Now, I am not saying that this small demonstration convinced me of anything. I had seen enough fakirs, close-quarter magicians, and peddlers of cheap parlour tricks not to be intimidated by so vulgar a display. It was, however, unsettling. Unsettling to see how badly Barrymore wanted me to believe that he was proficient in the dark arts, and the lengths to which he would go to convince me. In response to his glass smashing, I simply waited a few seconds before calling a waiter to have the pieces removed and a new tea brought over. Very impressive, I lied. You have my attention, though I don't really see what I can help you with. Over the next two hours, he told me. From a small briefcase that I had somehow not noticed him either holding or placing beneath the table, Barrymore produced a series of documents and placed them on the newly dried table for me to examine. It took me less than a second to recognize the Vatican seal, registration number, and stamp in the top corners of the documents. These are from the Vatican? I asked, without even glancing at the contents. I had, of course, handled similar documents over the years and was in no way overawed by the provenance of the documentation. However, owing to my previous encounters with such paperwork, I was acutely aware that the stamp on this particular collection marked them as being both internal and top secret, something which made their current location far from Rome and resting on a street tabletop at a cafe in Istanbul not only highly suspect, but also fantastically illegal. Eyeing Barrymore carefully and glancing over my shoulder to ensure that we were not being observed, I lifted the papers and, having angled them in such a way as to shield them from the view of any passers-by, began to read. After around five minutes, during which I skim-read perhaps five or six pages, I turned my eyes away from the text and back to Barrymore. From the way in which that superior smile danced upon his lips, I could see that the questions and surprise in my eyes had registered and were acknowledged. The documents you are holding cover an incredibly special collection of writings and relate, of course, to an extremely specific subject. They were obtained for me after an exceptionally long period of research by a frustrated priest who seems to have switched allegiances and now crosses himself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Green. He grinned broadly, clearly having found his own joke highly amusing. By this point, the sun had begun to sink over the Bosporus. The city's skyline of domed mosques and haphazard collections of buildings were bathed in a warm pink light that darkened at its edges into shades of deepening purple. It was, as is typical, a warm and balmy evening, and yet, somehow, even then, there came with that quilting warmth an undercurrent of chill. It reminded me, for a moment, of swimming in the ocean when, stepping or crossing into a new current, one feels, just for a second, an icy stream envelop the legs and arms, a single swirl, gone in moments, that whispers for just a second of the icy depths far from the sun, that lie far, far below. That cold breeze felt for a moment like a warning. The documents represent correspondence between the Holy See and the parishes throughout Europe over the course of almost 220 years. They also specify the locations of relics of immense value. I would like you to retrieve them. I stared once again at the documents and found myself, for one of only a handful of times in my life, entirely speechless. The papers as a collection were indeed records of correspondence, letters or perhaps more accurately 
appeals sent from bishops in locations as disparate as London and the Pyrenees, the island of Malta, and remote parishes in northern Scotland. I was to learn later that these papers, taken as a collection, were commonly referred to as the cri de coeur papers, cries from the heart. In each case, the letter was accompanied by two other documents, a letter from the Vatican in response and an edict signed by the Pope himself, authorizing the use and release of a sacred relic. In each case, a single piece of the betrayer's silver, a Judas penny. The intention behind dispersing these pieces, collected together at such cost of time and money, was to make use of their supposedly magical qualities. In every case documented, in which the bishop of some city had felt the need to write to the Pope personally, the reason for such an appeal was the same, a belief that the parish was being terrorized by a vampire. It seems that each parish that had written to the head of the church had been afflicted by such a creature. Their appeal was for a Judas penny to be sent to the area for use in both exterminating and trapping these fiends. The mythology, so obscure as to be considered by most, including myself, to be irrelevant, goes something like this. Silver, as a purifying metal, was traditionally thought to be used in the destruction of vampires, Whilst it somehow avoided being included in the pages of Stoker's famous novel, the use of silver against vampires was for a long time a very widespread belief, especially across Eastern Europe and some parts of France and Germany. In modern times, this aspect of the vampire legends had been transferred over to werewolves, and is the route from which we get the nonsense about silver bullets. In the period during which these letters were written, however, silver was not considered nonsense, but of the utmost importance. Owing to its proximity to Christ and his story, each Judas penny was considered to have cleansing, and indeed magical properties, far beyond that of common silver. The bishops had asked for one to be sent so that it could be used when disposing of the vampire, ensuring that they were dead and they requested that the material remain in the parish. The method, once the vampire was disposed of, was to use the silver, melted down, to coat the tip of a stake of around two meters in length. When the vampire's body was buried, often at a crossroads, but sometimes within the cemetery grounds, this stake would be driven through the chest of the corpse, marking the spot and also pinning the now dead creature into its pit. Bound by the silver, particularly silver of such magical providence, the monster would be pinioned like a butterfly fixed to a board, and unable to ever rise again. There had long been whispers that the church, during the height of such superstitions, had led a campaign to eradicate vampires from Europe altogether by using this method. Authorizing the distribution of the Judas pennies across the continent in an attempt to kill and indeed trap any and all living examples of these Nosferatu into their resting places. Only now, holding the genuine papers in my hand, did I finally believe that such a covert operation had taken place. I believed that they believed, and became extremely excited by what I read. Now I should say at this point, that whilst I now believed that the eradication campaign and redistribution of these valuable artifacts had taken place, when it came to the actual vampires, I had never believed in such things. That, to me, tales of people rising from the dead and drinking blood are just that. Tales. Stories that belong in books or at the Saturday matinee. However, this is not to say that I was not interested in the history of vampirism, and particularly in how it intersected with religious history, and the paraphernalia used by believers to rid themselves of their imagined tormentors. Indeed, only a year earlier I had retrieved, from a church in Macau, a jewel-encrusted crozier once thought to have belonged to St. Ignatius, who had reportedly used it to battle demons, and indeed, vampires. Such items were considered rare and of great value. They were extremely collectible, and as a result also immensely expensive. 
The Judas pennies were already of great value due to their age and their importance to the gospel narratives. The documents Barrymore provided acted as a confirmation of each piece's authenticity, at least in the eyes of the church. If only they could be retrieved, they would be worth a great deal. Add to this the intersection of this myth with folklore of the vampire, and you had an item of immense value. When I asked which of these artifacts Barrymore wished me to seek out, I was taken aback by his response. All of them. Leaning back in his chair, he explained that whilst he would take the individual pieces and pay a considerable sum for each, he would pay ten times the amount for a complete set. Naturally, I understood that a complete set of any item was more valuable than one individual piece separated from the others, but the offer of ten times the figure seemed excessive. I did not argue. Why would I? But Barrymore clearly recognized some inquisitive reflex in my face, for he felt the need to explain. It has long been a belief within my, shall we say, community of friends, that possession of all thirty pieces would grant the possessor eternal life, immortality. It was a mercy granted by Providence that Judas was able to use them to purchase the potter's field, and only after the transaction was complete could he actually end his life. Had he kept the pieces, he would have been cursed to walk the earth in a torment of guilt for all eternity. It is for this reason that the pieces are never kept together in the possession of a single individual, even during their stays in the Vatican. Indeed, there are records and edicts expressly forbidding them from being kept together in one place, that level of power being considered by the clergy to be too much for one individual. Here he again grinned broadly, as if to communicate the fact that he considered himself an individual more than capable of handling such power. Now we have a veritable road map that will allow us to collect all thirty pieces and will grant the possessor that boon, immortality, the chance to avoid death's clutches, and live on, enjoying all that life has to offer indefinitely. I knew, of course, that simple pieces of silver could grant no such wish. Had I been selling the pieces already in my possession and attached such a price based on such a claim, I would have been laughed at. Here, though, was a ready-made buyer actually offering to pay a massively increased price for a property that the objects did not, (laughs) could not, possess. Again, I was not going to argue. Though, again, as if looking through the front of my head and into my private thoughts, Barrymore addressed the exact thing I was considering. You think me mad. Mad for paying such a price for something that cannot be proven. Perhaps you are right. Barrymore lit another cigarette, and for the first time broke his intense stare, looking away from me and out into the creeping darkness. The money is not just for the items. It is for the work. Dangerous work. He then detailed what he wanted me to do, and, taking no heed of his warnings of danger, I gleefully accepted. Whereas it took Lamentor two decades to collect these relics, it took me only two years. Even then, Barrymore pressed me almost constantly, calling and sending letters, asking for progress reports, restlessly eager to get his hands on the complete collection. I often thought of joking that if the set did indeed grant eternal life or immortality, that he shouldn't be in such a rush. He was obviously going to have plenty of time, but I didn't joke. Instead, I focused on the task at hand, moving from city to city, scouting the area and evaluating the best way and best time to seize the prize. It was not easy work. To dig into a grave that has been settled for centuries requires a lot of exertion, not to mention the difficulties involved in avoiding detection. Some graves, such as the one in Whitby, literally had an iron grate built over the plot, like a sort of cage, just in case the stake of silver weren't enough. In another case, an entire effigy of marble and rock weighing several tons had been erected on and around the spot where the vampire was supposed to have been laid to rest, hardly the sort of thing you can simply run and grab.
One location in France was an actual crypt, the body resting inside a sarcophagus with a heavy stone slab atop. This is not to mention the occasions where the description of location did not match what was actually there when I arrived, forcing me to spend several days searching for the correct location before I made any attempt to retrieve the silver. Often, I would be forced to hire help, something which again took time, as I would not only need to vet the individuals to make sure they were capable, but also reliable and discreet. As time went on, journalists in several newspapers began to notice the pattern and report on the vampire grave robber who was seemingly travelling around Europe and breaking into the final resting grounds of these legendary fiends. Each time one of these reports hit the headlines, I would be forced to lay low, biding my time until the next strike. The reports also had the unfortunate knock-on effect of making the grave owners of parish officials more vigilant, so that where they might not have thought about their folkloric site for decades prior, they now decided to keep a more watchful eye, or in some cases, increase security. All of these considerations made retrieval of the artefacts more difficult. However, after only two excavations, I was more than convinced that the effort would be worth it. In both cases, I found silver tipping the edge of a stake that had been driven into the skeleton. In one, through the heart, as you might see in some schlocky hammer horror movie. In the other, through the open mouth of the poor individual accused of such crimes. In all of the time that I was collecting these pieces, the one thing that did not concern me was vampires. Despite having crept around up to my knees in grave dirt at midnight and having come face to face with almost thirty supposed vampires, I never once felt a chill because of the superstition. To me, these were the bodies of unfortunate people who, owing to the superstition and ignorance of their time, had suffered untimely and often violent deaths. Seeing their skeletons, long dead ramshackle collections of bones, I felt no fear except my own ever-present fear of death, a reality one cannot avoid when faced with the fragile remnants of another's life. Aside from the peculiarities of the burial and the violent nature of their deaths, the skeletons were entirely unremarkable, except for being tragic victims of their age. Other than that, they were no different to any other skeleton in the graveyard. That is, except for one. The final grave on my list was the supposed resting place of a Romanian vampire referred to in the legends as Strige. Technically not a name, but a collective noun for something resembling a vampire. Those remains were different. Whether it was some deformity or an abnormality in human development, a species of animal I was not familiar with, or some mixture of the two, animal bones having been buried alongside human remains, I don't know. But what lay in that grave was not your run-of-the-mill corpse. The skull was elongated, with something that looked more like a snout or muzzle, such as you might find on a dog or a horse, in size more like the latter, but in the formation of the teeth more like the former. For, jutting forwards from both segments of the jaw, partially damaged by the insertion of the silver-tipped stake, were fangs, not the dainty and prettily oversized canines you see in Dracula movies, but jagged, vicious things, the same length and thickness as a man's finger. Were this thing to clamp onto the throat, the result would not be pinprick puncture wounds of Hollywood, but a shredding tear that would rip the flesh to ribbons. For the first and only time, I felt a tightening in my chest and a frosty ripple of fear. Staring into the hollow sockets of this skull, I considered for a moment whether I might be able to also take this with me as a prize. Surely some collector would pay a handsome price for such a curious artifact. I reasoned, however, that trying to sell such an item might cause more complications than it was worth, linking me, as it would, to the other acquisitions. Beyond that, there was also something else— 
Unlike the other skulls, the many hollow remnants I had encountered during this grisly endeavour, this skull seemed somehow to stare back. It was an uncomfortable feeling, akin in some ways to the sensation of weight pressing on the chest or shoulders. I decided to remove the stake and leave the rest in situ. Doing so was easier said than done, and I cursed more than once with the effort of dislodging the blasted thing. Once I finally had, and the silver tip was secure inside my satchel, I walked the few minutes back to where I had parked the hire car, with the intention of making as speedy an exit as I could. To this day, I have never forgotten the sound of the scream that rang out into the night, the curdling, wrenching yelp from somewhere behind me, back amongst the trees, through the lines of graves, and I suspected from within the hollow of that pit. I delivered the pieces, all thirty, to Barrymore three weeks later. In the first fortnight, while still in Romania, I could not ignore the reports on the news of disappearances, including one of a young man found mauled. Initially it was thought by dogs. By the third week, I was out of the country and beyond the reach of that local news, able, for a while at least, to ignore the reports and what they might imply about my actions. The actual handing over to Barrymore was actually rather anticlimactic. I had placed the thirty pieces into a small display case, divided into thirty small segments. Handing it over to Barrymore, I was somewhat disappointed when he lifted the ashtray from the table and smashed the glass of the case, fishing out the pieces along with shards of splintered glass like someone committing a smash-and-grab at a jewellery store. He greedily transferred the pieces from the case into a small leather pouch and, abruptly standing, quizzed me furiously. This is all of them? All thirty? I nodded, reflecting that had he taken the time to count them he might have seen how many individual pieces there were. And they are from the places listed? Exactly the places listed? These need to be the genuine article. It is imperative that they are genuine. He spat the words with a mixture of forceful declaration and, beneath it, at least a small hint of desperation. Again, I nodded, rising from my seat to mirror his actions. In that case, he said with a sigh, the money will be with you by the end of the week. With that, he turned and walked away. I did not see him again until just over a year ago. When I next saw Barrymore, over thirty years later, he was lying in a hospital bed, and not only did he not look like himself, but he also looked like no human being I have ever seen alive. The previous day I had received a phone call from the hospital saying that a man named Barrymore had listed me as his next of kin, and that he was desperate to see me. The doctor added that if I did wish to see him, that it might be best to get here sooner rather than later. I will admit that I had no great desire to see Barrymore. Three decades of strange nightmares had made me somewhat regret having worked for him in the first place. But the phrase, next of kin, and what that might imply about Barrymore's last will and testament, implored me to visit him. I can say, happily, that I have never seen a vampire. The closest I have ever come to seeing the undead was that day when I saw Truman Barrymore. Even before I stepped onto the ward, the doctor in attendance warned me to prepare myself. He explained that Barrymore had been found several weeks earlier, barely alive by sewer workers. He had been lying, naked and almost entirely drained of blood, in a section of sewer close to London Bridge. I don't know when you last saw Mr. Barrymore, but I feel I should tell you to prepare yourself. He is in a bad way. I have no idea how long he has been down there and away from the sunlight, but whatever he has been doing has had a terrible effect upon his body. When the police and paramedics brought him in, he had lost so much blood he was virtually on the point of death, but his other issues are far more long-term. His musculature has almost entirely atrophied, as if he has been in a state of paralysis for many years. He is severely emaciated, 
almost to the point of starvation, and though he had some fresh injuries when he was brought in, he also has some very severe scarring from injuries suffered over a much longer period. I am not sure what happened to your friend, and he won't tell us, but whatever it was, he may not have long left. I nodded, shrinking a little from the doctor's use of the word friend in relation to Barrymore, and stepped onto the ward. People often use the phrase, a shadow of his former self, when referring to a drastic and negative change in an individual's appearance. In Barrymore's case, the metaphor would be inaccurate. His former shadow had more weight and substance to it than the pitiful fragment I saw before me. His cheeks were almost hollow, his eyes bulging, emphasized by the skull-like emptiness of the sockets. He looked, for all the world, like a skeleton onto which someone had painted a skin in a yellowy shade of not quite white. What struck me the most, however, were his teeth. For across both rows, Barrymore's entire set of teeth were made of silver. Silver for which I was sure I could name the source. For some god-awful reason, he had had the metal of the Judas pennies shaped into teeth and fitted into his own jaw. Perhaps, I thought, as a way of keeping all thirty pieces together in one place and achieving the immortality he so craved. Though, I reflected even then, if this were the life he was to live eternally, perhaps he would be better off dead. When he saw me, Barrymore burst into tears. Eventually, once he had settled himself sufficiently, he began to speak. What he told me made my blood run cold. It worked, he began. The Judas pieces, having them together, it gave me what I asked for. I cannot be killed. I cannot die. I stared at him, considering that in his current state he could be proven wrong at any second. He came for me in the first month. You see, he knew I couldn't die. That no matter how many times he fed upon me, no matter how many times he sucked and drained me dry, I would awake the following day ready to provide him with another meal. What better food source for an immortal predator than an immortal prey? I stared at the thick leathery knot of scar tissue that extended from his jawline to the top of his chest, as if something had taken a power tool to his neck and throat, realizing, as I did, that the new wounds the doctor had spoken of seemed almost to have healed. Thirty-three years. Thirty-three years dragged from one subterranean hovel to another, stored in his dark larders like a fly entombed in a web, waiting, alive and horribly awake, for the spider's return. At this he opened his hand, as fresh tears streamed and trickled down the jagged precipice of his cheeks. They found me and pulled me out, but he won't let me go. I am his bride now, his to feast upon, forever, unless I can die. I looked down and saw in his palm a chunk of silver, one end of which was attached to a dry and gelatinous mass of what looked like blood speckled with fragments of bone. There were scratches and dents in the silver, where the gripping bite of pliers had been. Take this. Perhaps if the thirty are no longer together, perhaps then the curse will be broken. Perhaps then I can die. I lifted the silver nugget from his hand. I have left you everything, my entire fortune, in exchange for the promise. You will never again, for as long as you are alive, allow these thirty pieces to be together in one place. Never. I promised, and was about to add something, when Barrymore lost consciousness, and the machines to which he was attached shrieked into life. A hustle of doctors and nurses rushed into the room, and I was bundled out of the door, still holding the silver tooth in one hand. When I returned to the hospital the following day, the doctor met me with a face the color of ash. As he spoke, his lip trembled. He told me that, somehow, Barrymore had gone missing. Though he was unable to stand unaided, he had somehow gone from the hospital without discharging himself.
The doctor was unsure as to what exactly had happened, but I could, if I wanted, speak to the nurse who was working the shift, though he could not promise that I would get much sense from him either. The doctor said these last words whilst looking very deeply into my eyes, as if trying to both communicate some truth and extract some confirmation of that truth from me. Eventually, satisfied that I could at least guess what he was referring to, he looked away and pointed me in the direction of the nurse. The nurse who had been on shift was now in a bed on the ward himself, having injured his head after fainting. He was being treated for concussion and had apparently not spoken much in the way of sense in the hours since his fall. I nevertheless decided to speak to him to find out what he could tell me about Barrymore's disappearance. To this day, I really wish I hadn't. All he kept repeating were the same few sentences, staring straight forward and seemingly unable to add any greater detail. All he would say was, It just took him. It came through the window and just dragged him from the bed. I tried to help him, but it had him. It just, it shook him like a dog with a chew toy or a rag or something. He was just lying there, dead, limp, and it, it just dragged him off and disappeared out of the window. There was nothing I could do. He dragged him off and they disappeared. There was nothing I could do. Looking at him, sitting bolt upright in bed, staring into the middle distance, muttering the same words over and over, I believed him. A few weeks later, I was contacted by a solicitor acting upon Barrymore's instruction that if he were to disappear, the will should come into effect. I became the sole benefactor and recipient of Barrymore's fortune. I used the money to open the Onger Slate Curiosity Museum, where I have kept the tooth ever since. For the remainder of my life, I shall endeavour to ensure that it is never reunited with the other twenty-nine pieces, hoping, as I do, that they have been scattered to the four winds, and are not, as I fear, still rooted to the jaw of the creature's favourite victim. Whether this separation will break the curse, and allow Barrymore the rest and peace he rejected in life, I do not know, but I doubt it, because whatever it was that came for him certainly didn't think so. This has been The Vampire's Price, a short, scary story, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell. Copyright 2021 by Michael Vandervoort. Production copyright by Michael Vandervoort.